The sixth week of the O.J. Simpson trial begins with a setback for the prosecution. Rather than continue presenting its case, prosecutors have to argue against allowing a new witness for the defense, a witness who prosecutors fear will unravel part of their case. I'm Roger Kosak, and this is O.J. 25. She doesn't have to be locked up, but she'll promise me she'll come back on Monday. Ms. Lopez, do you have something you wish to say? If I don't want to be here any longer. All these reporters have destroyed my life. Rosa Lopez was a housekeeper who lived next door to O.J. Simpson and worked for his neighbors. And she had claimed to the defense that she saw O.J.'s white Ford Bronco parked outside his house around 10 o'clock, which was the time of the murders. They had said the murders were around 10.15 that night. I am so afraid of so many things, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> You prometí venir, yo prometí venir. I promised to come today because I was promised that this was going to finish today and then I could go to El Salvador. The defense claims Lopez must testify as soon as possible. They say she is fleeing to her home country, El Salvador, to escape the media hounding her for her story. And they are about to lose her. It's my understanding that she will be, after leaving, after concluding testimony today, if she's so allowed, she will pick up her belongings, and we'll be leaving for El Salvador tomorrow. This has been brought about because the great amount of uh, harassment she's suffered since this happened, it's caused a great problem with her family. She came back on her own last night, but as I indicated, wants to leave immediately thereafter. So uh, this is certainly a situation where, in the interest of Mr. Simpson's fair trial, she be able to proceed to preserve this lady's testimony. She will, in all likelihood, be in El Salvador uh, after tomorrow. The defense says, listen, we want this testimony. We need this testimony. This is our alibi witness. This is the woman who says she saw the white Bronco at the time of the murder parked in OJ's driveway. So the defense wants to get her in front of the jury before their case even begins in the middle of the prosecution case. Miss Lopez spoke with a reporter from KMEX for two hours. She told that reporter that she didn't want to leave the area that she had no desire to return to El Salvador, uh, that she intended to remain here. All along, we've been concerned that the defense was seeking to uh, elicit this witness's testimony outside the presence of the jury so that they could test it and evaluate it and assess its value and then perhaps present it to the jury at a later time, knowing all the while that when the defense uh, prepares to put on his case that Ms. Lopez will actually be available and here in the country. We have Ms. Lopez here, and so perhaps we should direct some of these questions to her. We're ready to proceed, and would ask leave of court to proceed at this point. All right, call your witness. Okay, thank you. My first and only witness today, I hope your honor, will be Ms. Uh, Rosa Lopez. All right, Ms. Lopez, let's come forward. Rosa Lopez takes the stand without the jury present to testify in a hearing to determine if she is a flight risk. You're filling out unemployment insurance forms, is that correct? I wasn't filling them out. I was given the applications, but I haven't filled them out, sir. You understand that you have to live in California to receive unemployment insurance in California, correct? But because I want to leave, that is why I have not taken them in, sir. Do you understand? Okay. Well, I understand everything, Ms. Lopez. That's true. That's true, but there's no jury, so I'm going to let that one slide. You got a sense that the, the defense seemed to be driving the ship. That's true. That's true. No, not, not every situation, Mr. Cochran, is a, a comedy. Right, Mr. Darden, thank you. Because even when the defense was not doing any questioning, the prosecution was mindful that, that the defense was going to get up and speak any minute. Why were you living in another state 
over the course of the last several days. Because I can't go out, not even to go to the laundry or anywhere, because wherever I go, people are pointing at me. Did this cause some problems with your employer? Sí. Yes. Do you have any present plans to return to El Salvador? I would like to go tomorrow. And do you plan to leave for El Salvador tomorrow? Sí. Yes. All right, do you plan to come back to Los Angeles? No, no por largo tiempo. Not for a long time. Why is that? Because I don't want to be recognized by people anywhere. You've had your bags packed for a month, is that correct? Sí. Yes. You've been planning to go to El Salvador for a month? Sí. Yes. And you just made the reservation, didn't you? Yes. You made that today? Yes. Prior to coming to court this morning? Yes. Ms. Lopez, we just called the airline. They don't show a reservation for you. Can you explain to the court why it is that you just told us you have a reservation? Because I am going to reserve it, sir. As soon as I leave here, I will buy my ticket and I will leave. If you want to, the cameras can follow me. So you have not made a reservation. But I will make it as soon as I leave here. Okay, you have not made a reservation. one in the morning okay. because the airlines are closed at that time. You just, I have to wait. You just told us that you already made a reservation. Okay. But I will make the reservation, sir, and I will leave. That is for sure. Okay, and so when you told us that you already made a reservation, you were lying. No. Ms. Lopez, didn't you tell us that you made the reservation prior to your coming to court today? Yes or no? No. You didn't just tell us that? Yes, I told you. Yes, I told you. But you knew when you told us that that you had not made a reservation. Correct? Yes or no? Correct? Correct. You lied to us, didn't you? You don't ask a question unless you have the evidence to back it up. The best defense in the world is an alibi. There are only two really good alibis. One is being in jail. That will usually stand up. And the other is visiting the Pope in the Vatican. That's a pretty good alibi. We did not have an alibi as such. We had a series of alibis which, when linked together, made O.J.'s presence at the murder scene impossible. The prosecution's case hinges on the murders occurring at 10.15 p.m. Rosa Lopez seeing Simpson's white Ford Bronco parked outside his house around that time could prove he was home and didn't kill Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman. I have accepted her testimony to me that she is going to leave. And I've also accepted that she is a material witness and should testify before the jury. And Ms. Lopez, I apologize to you, but I've made the finding that I believe that you are going to return to El Salvador. Ms. Lopez, the planes fly, as you know, to El Salvador on a regular basis. I will start your case, your testimony in front of the jury. The first thing we do with the jury Monday, at 9 o'clock. I will do it for you, Your Honor. All right, do you promise me that you'll obey my order to return? Si. Yes. There are no notes that have not been turned over. There are no tape-recorded statements of Ms. Lopez. All right, Mr. Shapiro, would you uh, make a phone call to Mr. Pavlik, have him come to court forthwith, and we'll commence with the direct examination. Mr. Pavlik, would you come forward? My understanding is that you've been the investigator for the defense for the past several months, correct? Since June 14th, yes, sir. I'm not sure what they are talking about. There is no tape recording of Ms. Lopez by any of our investigators. With regards to the witness, Rosa Lopez, do you have any tape recordings of any statements? I tape recorded the uh, the first statement, which was the uh, July statement. The prosecution was really surprised by this because under the rules, they're supposed to have access to all this evidence. They're supposed to, all this evidence was supposed to have been turned over to them before the trial. 
The written record of the O.J. Simpson trial consists of over 100,000 pages of transcripts, police records, and autopsy notes. Court TV has those documents and more. There are also trial memos written by Court TV reporters and producers. In this instance, they describe what happens outside the camera's view when it is revealed that there is an audio tape of the Rosa Lopez interview after all. The you-know-what hits the fan. As it comes out, the defense has failed to inform prosecutors of Lopez's interview with investigator William Pavlik. And then, finally, that there is, in fact, a tape recording of that interview. There was a gasp from the whole prosecution team, and Darden bit his upper lip and threw up his arms. Pavlik tried to save the defense attorney's necks by saying they were unaware of the Lopez audio until he brought it to their attention just the day before. When Carl Douglas earlier said confidently there was no tape recording, he may have been digging his own grave. So this was a big breach of the rules, and there was um, a lot of controversy around it. Both sides have been provided with a uh, standard cassette copy of this uh, interview. The record should also reflect that uh, moments ago, counsel uh, for both sides and the court in chambers listened to the uh, tape recording uh, of this particular uh, interview. This is what lawyers from both sides hear when the tape is played in the judge's chambers. When did Mr. Simpson and this person come back? Do you remember? Um, nine o'clock. Could it be about 930, 930, 930, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, 940, basically coached and told what to say through every bend and turn. Ms. Lopez uh, gave very little input into that interview. There are a number of inconsistencies in that tape, in that taped interview. I find this unbelievable what I have seen. And to hear this tape was, was just, I'm, I'm speechless. I'm speechless to think that there were, I'm speechless, I know, that tells you something. <laughs> I've never, I've never seen anything like this. Marsha Clark was known in Los Angeles and among prosecutors as a very, very capable, very good prosecutor with a really, really good track record of, of getting prosecutions and getting, getting guilty verdicts and convictions. Um, but she, she, had a, she had a hard time. Uh, there was a lot of pressure on her. The bickering between the lawyers continues. The prosecution discovers the defense didn't disclose one of Lopez's written statements, where she talks about a conversation she had with a woman named Sylvia. This morning, a document, which is a two-page statement concerning Rosa Lopez, was turned over to the prosecution. That document, Your Honor, included reference to an undocumented housekeeper who is named Sylvia, who is acquainted with Ms. Lopez. Ms. Lopez had expressed severe concern that Sylvia, since she was undocumented, did not want to have any involvement at all in this particular case. The defense has deliberately withheld material information concerning this witness. No one knows what's on that tape. No one knows what's in those notes. And if the jury doesn't get to know that this witness has made prior inconsistent statements, how can they effectively evaluate her credibility? Obviously, Rosa Lopez put this person into her July 29th statement for the express purpose of showing how credible she was. And when the defense found out that Sylvia was not only not going to corroborate Ms. Lopez, but was going to say she's a liar, and no such thing ever happened, and I wasn't at her house, and I did not make an observation of the Bronco, she conveniently disappeared from the statement. Who knows what else they have? Who knows what else they're sitting on? We were given a very uh, assured, confident statement that there was nothing else, only to be confronted at the 11th hour with this other statement that came floating out. The tape was turned over by Mr. Pavlik. They had the tape this morning by 9.30. It's a 12-minute tape, 
So whatever they need to do, Your Honor, we're ready to proceed. There is a, a consequence out of their misconduct, which is only hurting the prosecution and has not so far had any significant effect on the defense and certainly has not done anything that would cause them to stand up and take notice of this court means business. Given the fact that there have been 30,000 pages the people have represented of discovery that has been turned over, that in fact it is, an, it is invariable and expected that there would be an occasional falling through the cracks. I think it would be highly inappropriate under these circumstances uh, to suggest to the jury uh, that any adverse inferences could be drawn against Mr. Simpson uh, based on the withholding of evidence? I was hired as Mr. Simpson's initial lawyer and remained his lead counsel until the beginning of presentation of evidence, at which time Mr. Cochran took responsibility as being the chief trial lawyer for this case. But this began and this remained as a team effort. And as such, somebody on a team must take ultimate responsibility. I will take that responsibility. Rosa Lopez does return to court, but nothing is simple in this trial. So her testimony is delayed. Marsha Clark makes a last minute plea. She doesn't want Lopez in front of the jury. She wants her testimony to be taped, a process called a 1335 conditional examination. The order of witnesses is a very important matter that we know the court is aware of. This is why the defense is so desirous of having this witness taken out of order. So we would ask that the court um, take the witness's testimony today, but allow us to do that as a conditional examination. This was litigated, and as always, the people, you know, it's, it, it's, it's beyond disingenuous for somebody to come into this court at 6.30 after you brought all these jurors over here. We're ready to proceed, and, and, and the witness makes a promise to you she'll come back, and they say, well, I, we can't do it tonight, Judge, because i got to pick up my children, and the court is sensitive to that. And it was only was a ploy for them to go and try to cry and moan over the weekend and come up with some other document. I'm offended as a woman, as a single parent, and as a prosecutor and an officer of the court, to hear an argument posed by counsel like that, Mr. Cochran, today. Some of us have child care issues, and they are serious, and they are paramount. Obviously, Mr. Cochran cannot understand that, but he should not come before this court and impugn the integrity of someone who does have those considerations. And I'm deeply offended. She was the only woman out of the major lawyers on, on both sides. As a working mom myself now, uh, I look back on what Marsha Clark went through and I feel a lot of uh, real compassion for her now that, that was hard for me as a young woman, younger woman to really understand, but she went through so much. These were things that none of the men had to face, uh, but she had to face on a regular basis. Marsha is an incredibly an incredibly strong person. But the media really has placed her in an unfair position. What about the children in this? You think they're deaf? A five-year-old knows what's going on. You've placed Marsha and other prosecutors in just a horrible situation. It's not fair. You have this kind of um, intersection of legitimate reporting along with more, um, you know, what we call tabloid reporting or yellow journal journalism. Because at this point, it's a circus. I appreciate the fact that both sides uh, anticipated going forward with her testimony before the jury today. <clears throat> the original defense request was for a 1335 conditional examination, which I granted. And after our discussions, uh, I was under the impression that both sides agreed that it would be better under all circumstances than to have Ms. Lopez testify before the jury. Uh, however, the rights of both sides will be protected under the 1335 procedure, so I will modify my order. I'm more than willing to change my mind when I feel it's appropriate.
As Johnny Cochran plans to finish questioning Rosa Lopez, Judge Ito tells her about the new delay. Ms. Lopez, your attorney has indicated that you wish to speak to me again, and I've explained to your attorney that we've had another delay in our proceeding. The delay is based upon the fact that the prosecution was given a tape recording of your first interview only this morning. Quiero decirle, I want to tell you que yo fui muy honesta con usted, that I was very honest with you. Usted me dijo, regrese el, el lunes. You told me, come back on Monday. Y yo vine el lunes. And I came on Monday. Y yo fui muy honesta con mis abogados. And I was very honest with my attorneys. Con cualquiera de ellos hubiera sido lo mismo. With any one of them, it would have been the same. Vine de, de muy lejos. I came from very far. Para, para, para salir de esto. To finish with this. Y ahora, y el jueves me van a decir otro día más. And today, and on Thursday, I'm going to be told another day. Y yo estoy muy enferma, señor. Yo no como todos los días, señor. And I am very sick, sir. I don't eat I not sleeping every very day, well. sir. I'm not sleeping very well. Y, y, y le voy a decir, esto no es mi culpa. And I'm going to tell you, this is not my fault. Yo estoy muy cansada, mi I am very tired. I want to go rest, sir. I don't want any more questions. As week six continues, Millions of people watching the trial are witnessing the drama of Rosa Lopez. But who exactly is she? Who is this person that the defense is fighting so hard to put on the stand and the prosecution is fighting so hard to keep off the stand? Her face tells the story of a life of hardship. Rosa Lopez is born in a small town in El Salvador. She works on her parents' farm and walks miles to get to school. She quits school at age 10 because her family can't afford to buy her books. Later in life, Lopez becomes a housekeeper, gets married, and moves to the United States. She has seven children. Only four survive childbirth. One of her sons dies while fighting in El Salvador's civil war. She says she wants to return to her home country to escape the attention from the trial, move into the home her son left her, and buy a proper headstone for his grave. Good afternoon, Ms. Lopez. Buenas tardes. Thank Good you for staying. Mr. Cochran. Good afternoon, Ms. Lopez. Do you know uh, the gentleman is to my left, sitting next to Mr. Shapiro here? Mr. O.J. Simpson. Uh, do you wear glass eyeglasses? Si, si. Yes, sir. Do you have your eyeglasses with you today? No. No. Are you able to see clearly on the monitor there before you? No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Let me see what I can see. I know eating too much fish, for it, I lost my, my eyes. I can see from it. I can't see anything with those. No. no distingo dónde está mi casa en este pedacito. I can't distinguish where my house is in that small portion. Let me show you a larger board. Maybe she can step down and take a look at the big screen. Would that help? I went outside to the street between 8 and 8.15, approximately. All right, when you say approximately, were you wearing a watch that particular evening, if you recall? No, senor. No, sir. I saw the clock that I have on my night table. All right, and while you were out there, out on Rockingham. Do you ever have occasion to see any cars parked on Rockingham? It's not leading. Do you see any cars parked? It's not leading. There was a white car, a Bronco. Oh, 
como desde las nueve. Around nine, a little after nine, I saw Mr. Simpson that left in the black car with another passenger, I don't know who. Was that a man or a woman? Yo no lo vi. I yeah. didn't see Yo solo it. Le... No sé I just saw era. the uh, blonde hair or yellow hair. Como a las nueve y media antes, Around 9.30 or before, I heard steps, and uh, I was in my bedroom, and I don't know which way they were going. I don't know if they were on the Salinger's side of the property or on Mr. Simpson's. And what did you do when you heard uh, these footsteps? I ducked down like this because I was really afraid, and then I came back up. After you ducked down and you were afraid, uh, what else happened? I heard again that a car came by, and I heard when they shut the door. And I heard that Mr. Simpson talked to somebody for a few seconds. All right, and you know about what time of evening that was at that time? More or less uh, 15 to 10 or something like that. What next happened after that? Well, by then it was 10 and I had to take the dog back outside. And uh, what car did you see parked out there, if any? The Bronco. The Bronco. Anything else attract your attention uh, later that evening? I heard the voice, and I couldn't distinguish what Mr. Simpson was saying. I heard the voice, but I don't know what he said. Then everything was quiet. Did there come a time when things weren't quiet in and around your residence or Mr. Simpson's residence? Uh, about 12 midnight, I heard that uh, men that were talking on the uh, Rockingham side, and uh, yeah. his dog uh, was barking a lot. To the best of your recollection, what was the last time that you heard these voices? Around 12.30, I think. Mrs. Lopez, when this police officer identified himself to you. Can you tell me what name he gave you? Me dijo Mark Freeman. He told me Mark Freeman. All right. I wanted to point out to the court that in addition to this tape itself, which now the internal inconsistencies as well as the inconsistencies with each statement, mm -hmm. as well as the inconsistencies with her direct testimony, and the inconsistencies with other witnesses who will testify in this case, are numerous, are glaring, and are of major significance to her testimony and her credibility. Deputy Mayor, let's have Ms. Lopez, please. Good morning, Ms. Lopez. Buenos dias, señor. Good morning, uh, sir. Are you uh, glad to be here today? No, señor. No, sir. <laughs> Why not? Por qué no? <laughs> oh, you still would rather not be here, is that right, ma'am? No, no. And are you still planning to leave the Los Angeles area as soon as you finish testifying? Sí, señor. Yes, sir. As Johnny Cochran wraps up his questioning of Rosa Lopez, admirers are sending her flowers, money, and even job offers. The bouquets arrive in droves and quickly fill up the courtroom. You understand the difference between truth and a lie, correct? Si. Yes. When you told us last Friday that you hadn't filled out your unemployment forms, that was a lie, correct? No. You had filled out your unemployment forms, hadn't you? Yo me referí. I was referring to the application that is, that one is given for one to take it back. You never applied for unemployment? See, si. Yes. You told us last week that you weren't turning in your forms for unemployment because you were leaving the country. See, si. Yes. But in fact, you had turned in your forms, correct? Correcto. 
No, le, no, no le entendí. I didn't understand you. Well, have you filed for unemployment? Sí, señor. Yes, sir. You told us that you'd made reservations to leave the country that morning when in fact you had not, correct? Sí. Yes. Okay. And you knew that? Sí. Yes. And you lied? No. No. Not only did you not make reservations last Friday morning, but you didn't admit that fact until I confronted you with proof that you had not made the reservation. Correct? Yes. Do you recall where specifically it was that you parked your car that day? No. No. Was it in the morning? No, me recuerdo. I don't remember. Was it in the afternoon? No, me recuerdo, señor. I don't remember, sir. Did you recall if it was after dark? No, señor. No, sir. Your Honor, would you kindly instruct Mr. Cochran to not feed this witness the answers to the questions, please? Mr. Davis, I'm sitting over here. I don't know if I didn't notice anything that was leaving. Mr. Cochran. Your Honor. All right. Yeah. I mean, as, as, as amusing as I find Mr. Cochran, uh, he is making speaking objections, and the witness is adopting his objections as her answers. And All I right. think that's clear and apparent yeah, to everybody watching this. And so, well, then, why, right. why continue to make speaking Counsel, objections, thank Mr. You. Cochran? When I ask you a question, you look over at the lawyers on the other side of the I table. I can see you, then. Okay, I can turn my shirt this way, see you. I see Mr. Get I can see only you. Now. I can see you, Mr. Oh, okay. I look at my bed and look at you. <laughs> Actually, Ms. Lopez, since we are tape recording, I'd okay. prefer if you looked at Mr. Darden. Taking my picture beautiful, okay? Thank you. Everybody Good. looking me new today. Yeah. You can look at the camera if okay. you want to look at me. Okay. That's fine. Fine. The voices you heard around 11.30 or 12, were those the last voices you heard that night? Si, senor. Yes, sir. Well, when you testified the other day, you testified that you heard voices around 12.30. Excuse me, counsel. Objecting that on that last question, I heard verses 12 30. She didn't say how long the voices last. That's an objection to the question. Overruled. When you testified the other day, you said you heard the voices at 12 30. Up until 12 30, sir. That's what I said. Now, did you get that cue from Mr. Cochran's objection here? That's argumentative. Overruled. No me ha dado ninguna seña. He hasn't given me any cue. Okay. Did you ever see Mr. Cochran wave his hands like this back and forth across the you... chest today? No, señor. No, I sir. Have, I know we have videotape, but do you want to describe the gesture you just made for the record? Okay. You never saw Mr. Cochran make a motion like this? Nunca vio que el señor Cochran hiciera una moción así con sus manos? No, señor. No, sir. Sort of a, a gesture similar to an umpire indicating safe several mm -hmm. times. Did you ever see Mr. Cochran make a gesture like this during the testimony? En algún momento vio usted que el señor Cochran hiciera un gesto así durante su testimonio? No, señor. No, In, sir. Indicating a third base coach saying slide. <laughs> <laughs> That's about the closest I can get. When Mr. Darden asked uh, Ms. Ms. Lopez a question, about what we had talked about, and she said uh, she was told to tell the truth. Mr. Darden started to kind of, he made a sound that was kind of like a laugh or, or some kind of a sound. I asked Your Honor to strike that from the record, if Your Honor recalls. Um, I then looked at Chris, as I oftentimes do, and I asked her to strike that from the record. And I went like this, get that from the record or whatever. She was trying to tell me that she couldn't get a, a laugh or a smile or a grin down. And I wanted to make that clear for the record, that I will hold anyone actionable who would make any such a statement like that. I would never, ever do anything like that, and I very much resent it. And I would like, Your Honor, to uh, hear from Chris with regard to the fact she, st she sat there and watched me do that. Is that correct, Chris? Yes, yes. So I, I'm, just, I'm just furious that, that people would be so desperate, Your Honor, for a story. This was a giant stage, and every actor that started playing in here saw that the value and the long range effect of a successful prosecution or a successful defense. So you have basically, it was just, uh, it was a bunch of actors uh, for a uh, audition and everybody can't have the leading role, but everybody was competing for it. 
I'm going to ask you to look at your monitor again and pay careful attention. You were lying, weren't you? All right, good morning again, Ms. Lopez. Buenos dias, señor. All right, morning, you, remind, sir. you were reminded you were still under oath. Mr. Darden, you may resume with your cross-examination. Did you ever tell anyone that you disliked Nicole because Nicole had slapped Michelle? Hey, perdón. It's true. A nadie le gusta que le peguen, señor. Nobody likes to get slapped, sir. And so you were angry at Nicole for having slapped Michelle, correct? No. No. No le pegó a mí. She didn't hit me because I would have hit her back. Did you ever tell anyone that you hated Nicole? I didn't say that I hated her. I said that I didn't like her. This is a portion of the taped interview that the witness had with Mr. Bill Pavlik. At some point in time, did you hear O.J. talking again? No. But at, at uh, about 10 o'clock, you hear him talking outside. Yes. Now, is he talking to a person or is person. He... Okay. How long after that did you take the dog for a walk? I took it the dog ten... Ten twenty. So... Uh, ten fifteen something to take my dog for a walk. So you take your dog for a walk about ten fifteen, ten twenty, ten thirty. Yeah. Okay. So you told Mr. Bill that you took your dog for a walk at ten twenty? <laughs> If that's what he says, 10, 15, 10, 20, that's fine for me. Did Mr. Bill show you a time written on a piece of paper at that point? No, senor. No, sir. Did he point to the words or the numbers 10, 20? No, senor. No, sir. Did you hear yourself on the tape agree Usted with Mr. Pavlik when he said that you saw the Bronco all the way up until 11 o'clock? I never told them that I had seen the Bronco at 11 o'clock, sir, but if he says yes, then I say yes. Okay. Well, when you agree with Mr. Pavlik that you had seen the Bronco at 11 o'clock, you were lying, weren't you? No, señor, porque nunca no, el señor. Sir, él lo dijo, señor. Because I never told him that I had seen it at 11 o'clock, sir. He told me, sir. Did a reporter ask you? on June 13, 1994, whether or not you heard voices. So many things were being asked of me. I don't remember. You don't remember telling a KABC reporter that you heard voices, but that you did not know what time it was when you heard those voices? I have never told anyone of the reporters that I have heard voices, sir. I'm going to ask you to look at your monitor again and pay careful attention. What did you see and hear today? Oh, I hear a lot of police, a lot of the, the, the FBI coming knock my door. I say, this Mr. Simpson is a good guy. You know, I don't want you to say. I'm over here, but very late, very late. I don't know what time. That's Mr. Simpson's voice? Or... No, 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 oh. I don't know. I don't know, because I don't get out. My best friend over there, I don't know. I can hear only voice. I don't know what they talk or nothing, because I can hear nothing very well. But I know he's a very nice guy. But now you see yourself there on television, right? Sí, okay. señor. Okay. Yes, sir. And you did tell a reporter that you heard voices, didn't you? Noises. And no voices, señor. So you're saying that you said noise? Sí, señor. Yes, sir. But you didn't say voice? No. Well, do you have a faulty memory? No, señor, que yo crea. No, sir, not that I believe so. When was the first time that you were interviewed by Mr. Pavlik? I no me recuerdo, señor. Oh, I don't remember, sir. How many times were you interviewed by Mr. Pavlik? No me acuerdo. I don't remember. Was it more than five times? I don't remember. 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 I don't, I don't, I don't, 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 don't. Was it on July 29th? Maybe. Judge Ito sanctions the defense for the late discovery of the audio tape. Defense attorneys Carl Douglas and Johnny Cochran are fined $950 each. And if Lopez's testimony is presented to the jury, Ito will instruct the jurors that the defense violated the law with its late disclosure. The defense got to see her cross-examined, picked apart on cross-examination, decided she didn't really hold up, and never presented it to the jury. So after all of that craziness, the jury never even saw Rosa Lopez. What I saw in this case with the interruption was the defense 
controlling the courtroom. The ability to interrupt the prosecution's case and take them off their game for a week was really important. And the fact that Judge Ito somehow allowed that to happen really put the defense in control in that, in that, in that courtroom, and I think they never gave it up. Once again, the rumor mill at the L.A. County Courthouse revs up with the word that yet another juror in the O.J. Simpson trial is about to be replaced. The rumors are true. There was so much drama that surrounded the jury. I mean, there was so much drama in this case, so the jurors were not excluded from it. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the court has found good cause to excuse one of the uh, jurors on the original 12. Remember, they were sequestered. I think it was the longest sequestration in U.S. history. Sequestration is, a, is something that rarely happens. Most of the time, jurors get sent home. And these people who are total strangers live together for, in this case, uh, seven, eight months. Uh, you know, if I was on that jury, I would have hated everybody, and I'm sure by the time this case was over, the jurors did hate each other. Uh, in fact, there's some evidence that they didn't get along very well. Michael Knox is removed from the jury for what is described as misconduct, namely, that he made a bet with one of his co-workers on the outcome of the trial. There are also claims that he has a history of domestic violence that he hid from the court. He denies all of those claims. I don't agree with the reason why I was dismissed. But uh, that was his call. It's interesting to note that the prosecution, who had been fighting for weeks to get Mr. Knox removed, may have been surprised that Knox said thus far he thought the prosecution presented a good case. Now that he's been dismissed, Judge Ito asked Knox not to discuss the details of the case. We are going to select a replacement at this time. Mrs. Robertson, would you uh, please draw a number from the uh, list of alternates? Juror number 353, please have a seat in seat number 12. The new juror, number 353, is a white female. She's a Pac-Bell employee who's been married for 15 years and lives in San Gabriel Valley. Apparently, juror 353 recently tried to get off the jury because of the strain sequestration has put on her family. She was primarily concerned about her 13-year-old son. Ito refused her request because he said he needed her. All right, number 353, when I said we needed you to stay. Okay. <laughs> The jury is now made up of eight African Americans, two whites, one Hispanic, and one Native American. It's not the last time the demographics of the jury will change. It was a mostly minority jury, um, mostly African American, and mostly female. The sixth week ends with a new jury makeup and the prosecution's case losing steam. An entire week spent arguing over Rosa Lopez, a witness that, in spite of all the drama surrounding her, will never testify in front of the jury. Coming up, police testimony resumes, including controversial detective Mark Furman. That's next on OJ25. I'm Roger Cossack. <laughs>